Hello, my name is Amanda May Kim, and I'll be reading a piece of nonfiction called Van Life, uh, which is written in four parts. And I'll just read a short piece from three of the sections. And for the sake of the story, I should mention that I'm a Japanese, Korean, Californian who grew up uh, in uh, some of California's very poor rural areas. Part one, Bande. Our family was part of a group of agricultural workers and tenant farmers, Japanese, Mexican, Filipino, and Chumash, living in a region famous for strawberries, labor strikes, and boxers. My mother or grandmother would shout, Bande, and my brothers and cousins and I would clamor into the van, elbow our way to an overturned crate or a bag of mulch to use as a seat, and cling to each other as we wound our way through mountain roads and coastal bluffs. We never knew where we were going until the door slid open to reveal a forest floor covered in fat pine cones, a stretch of glittering tide pools full of salty limpets and sweet rock crab, or usually a field full of unpicked green beans. Every part of our lives involved vans. On New Year's, my grandparents lit incense for their van, just as they once had for their horses and cows. Our only public art was the painted vans we saw on the highway muscled stallions galloping across the desert, ocean sunsets with a saint floating in the sky. Part two, dream big, live small. I heard a story on public radio last month. Apparently millennial coders, accountants, and others have happily taken up the van life. The journalist described a customized van's headroom and narrow interior, and I knew it was a Mer Mercedes-Benz Sprinter, even before she said the words. I had a taste of van life, eating Velveeta because it doesn't go bad, and living in the 70s version of that exact same cargo van. Ours was bright green and modified for camping, one of just 20 or so sold in the US. My mother spent $25,000 on it, which was a scandal back then. She could have bought an actual house with that money, but she had just discovered that my father was having an affair, and she was determined to empty their shared accounts a signal that she too could destroy what they had built together. When my parents split up, they each took two kids. My two older brothers went with my father and my younger sister and I climbed into the van with our mother. For six months, we lived in the backyard of a mansion where my mother worked as a housekeeper. I made peanut butter sandwiches for my sister. We were five and 10. Today, when I see vans in my neighborhood, I can tell when there are people living inside by the heat shields, the privacy curtains, and the fogged windows cracked open to let in fresh air. Even in summer, van life can be cold at night. There's nowhere to go to the bathroom and smells can't escape metal and glass. You keep your food in a plastic bin. You bathe with a washcloth that is never totally clean or dry. You wear gym clothes to bed and school clothes to gym. Bed clothes are luxury. Part four, lay down my sleepy head. Our green van kept running into the 90s, so it turned out to be a good investment after all. By that time, my parents had reunited and moved to a little ranchette in Fairmead, a poor, unincorporated African-American town in what was once the heart of California's Klan country. As I drove to my parents' house, I passed collapsing mobile homes, tiny bungalows with tarps over the roofs, window frames filled with peeling plywood boards. By then, hundreds of household wells had run dry. Agribusinesses had sucked the water out from under them, and people had to go to the next town to buy bottled water. The night sky still glowed from the world's largest women's prison a few miles down the road. When my father was dying, he always wanted to go to the African-American church on Sundays. He had grown up in South Los Angeles at the height of the Depression. Because his parents were political refugees from Korea, his American culture was African-American culture. He sat in segregated theaters, went to segregated schools, and he grew up going to the black church. There's a particular kind of sadness that comes when you're holding your dying father's hand in the parking lot of a church, listening to gospel music. We never went inside. We didn't want to intrude. His words were gone, but somehow there was an echo inside him. A boy 75 years ago, who could still warble softly, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. When the music part of the service ended, we drove away. Thank you.